Hello everyone. We are on chapter 7 in our Concepts of Biology OpenStax book and looking at the cellular basis of inheritance. We'll be looking at three sections in this chapter. Section 7.1 which is sexual reproduction. 7.2 a process called meiosis. 7.3 what happens when meiosis goes wrong so errors in meiosis. If you'll remember from previous chapters the ability to reproduce is one of those characteristics that all life forms share. And in some cases, the offspring that are created resemble the parents. Sometimes they're actual clones of the parent, such as in single-celled organisms like bacteria or a single-celled protist when they clone themselves by a mitotic-like division. Uh, many single and multi-celled organisms can reproduce sexually, however. In sexual reproduction, this is where we're going to have the production of haploid cells by parents. If you don't know what a haploid cell is, it's a cell that has only one set of chromosomes. The opposite of that would be a diploid cell, DI, diploid, would be the prefix for two, so a diploid cell has two sets of chromosomes. So in sexual reproduction, haploid cells must be created, and these haploid cells must fuse together, a process that we often call uh, fertilization, and then this can create a new organism that has variation that's unlike the original cells or from the parents. This is actually an evolutionary success. An evolutionary success because this variation that is introduced into the species helps to ensure survival. And some pictures here. Each of us, like these other large multicellular organisms, begins life as a fertilized egg. Just a small microscopic cell and can divide many, many times, trillions of cell divisions that develops into a complex multicellular organism like the ones we see here. Makes you think. So after our introduction here, we get to section 7.1, which is sexual reproduction. And by the end of this section, you should be able to explain that variation among offspring is a potential evolutionary advantage resulting from sexual reproduction. And describe the three different life cycle strategies among sexual multicellular organisms and their commonalities. What do they have in common? So sexual reproduction was an early innovation after the appearance of eukaryotic cells on Earth. The first cells that were on Earth would have reproduced only asexually. But sexual reproduction came not too long thereafter and has stuck around all this time. Therefore, there must be some evolutionary advantage to why sexual reproduction makes species so uh, successful. And that's why we infer, and inference is a statement based on evidence, we infer that sexual reproduction helps with evolutionary success. And in many organisms, it's the only way to reproduce, including in humans. There are some disadvantages, though, obviously. It does take some energy to uh, expend to find a mate. Imagine um, if there's not a lot of your type of organism around, and you have to seek out a partner. And maybe you even need to attract that partner, put energy into that. Maybe you need to even fight for a partner. That expends a lot of energy. And in doing so, in expending all that energy, you really only get to give about 50% of your genes to your offspring. Whereas in asexual reproduction, you get to give 100% of your genes. And asexual reproduction is really fast, and you don't have to expend energy in finding a partner. But the big advantage with sexual reproduction is the variation that's created in the offspring. The genes are reshuffled during this process called meiosis. It's a, a beautiful process. 
It ensures the survival of someone to the next generation. So think about this, that if all humans had exactly the same DNA, that would mean we would all have exactly the same immune system. And some pathogen or some sort of germ could come along and wipe us all out because we're all the same and nobody would be able to survive to give rise to our next generation. But if we're all just a little bit different, then yes, perhaps somebody will have a little bit different immune system to survive whatever comes along and give rise to that next generation. Just using the immune system is this one example of how that gives us variation for our species to survive and hopefully not go extinct. So advantages gained by slight variations can give you the edge over the competition. That's something to remember even kind of as an individual that these differences can give you an edge over others to help you survive. Now uh, we're probably just uh, used to how humans do it where we have sperm and egg. Sperm and egg are called our gametes. Those are our haploid cells. They have just one set of chromosomes and those get together and fertilize each other which then restores the number back to diploid or two sets of chromosomes. So the sex cell, sperm and egg are the gametes. They fertilize each other and create a diploid cell which can also be called a somatic cell and then those go on to uh, reproduce or divide until they make the organism. So there's three main categories though of how this occurs. I just gave you an example of how that occurs in humans and a lot of animals, but there's other strategies out there. There's uh, strategy number one, the diploid dominant strategy, where the diploid life stage is dominant and obvious. And the haploid stage, not very obvious. Um, do you know what organism I'm talking about here? If you said animals, yeah, then you were right. In animals, the haploid cells are the gametes and they fertilize each other. They're uh, created from diploid germ cells in the testes and ovaries that go through a process called meiosis to make them into haploid cells. And then those gametes will lose their ability to divide by mitosis. They need to be fertilized in order to create uh, the next individual. So that's our strategy and most animals have that strategy. But there's a few other ones that we might call weird, but uh, to those organisms, that's what they do. And they may even outnumber us. So uh, haploid dominant is number two. Uh, that's the multicellular haploid stage. That's the most obvious life stage. So picture a bunch of gametes that are just living as single-celled organisms. And there's no multicellular diploid stage. So you're going to see this in a lot of fungi and algae. And in uh, strategy number three, that's called alternation of generations. The haploid and diploid stages are apparent to one degree or another, depending on what the group is. So they'll go through stages where they have little haploid cells running around doing their thing and stages where it's the diploid cells running around doing their thing. And this happens in certain plants and some algae. And in our next slide, we have some pictures that you could follow if you wanted to take a look at those and diagrams that out so maybe it makes it a little bit more visual for you. Unfortunately, in the slide version, of uh, the open stacks, these are kind of small in the slides and hard to see. But if you go to the textbook or the online textbook, they're a lot bigger and a little bit easier to follow. So let's talk about this process, this beautiful process that creates haploid cells or gametes. It's called meiosis. Not to be confused with mitosis, which we've already discussed, but meiosis which is significant in sexual reproduction. So by the end of this section, section 7.2, you should be able to describe the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis. So pay attention to what those chromosomes are doing. 
describes cellular events during meiosis. What's the whole cell doing and the nucleus doing? Explain the difference between meiosis and mitosis. So do a little comparison of them and explain the mechanisms within meiosis that generate genetic variation among the products of meiosis or among the daughter cells that are created through this process. So sexual reproduction requires fertilization of cells, the gametes, the sperm and egg, or the reproductive cells that contain one set of chromosomes each. So these gametes, once again, they are haploid cells. Fertilization then will restore that number of chromosomes back to two sets, which is the diploid cell stage, DI, that prefix means two, so those have two sets of chromosomes. Most animal and cells of plants are diploid, and we can also call diploid cells our somatic cells or our body cells. So all these cells here, my skin, my face, uh, my liver cells, those are all diploid or somatic or body cells. They have their two sets of chromosomes, whereas only sperm and egg are haploid, having one set. So meiosis is going to ensure that the number of chromosomes don't double with each generation. Because if you think back to how mitosis works, we know that before mitosis in the cell cycle, there's that S phase, and that's when DNA is synthesized or duplicated. That same thing happens before meiosis as well. And so uh, with mitosis, we do just the one division, and we get our uh, regular diploid cell back again with two sets of chromosomes. Imagine if that diploid cell fertilized another diploid cell, how many chromosomes that would result in. And then in the next generation that happened again, cells would get too many chromosomes. So meiosis is division that uh, occurs twice to get us always back down to one set of chromosomes. That way we don't ever end up with too many, although there are going to be some exceptions and some errors that can happen with any of these processes that we'll talk about later. Meiosis evolved from mitosis and therefore uses a lot of the same machinery like a mitotic spindle and centrioles. Um, so that will kind of look familiar, but there are going to be some differences that we'll note, like in the way the chromosomes act, and then the number of chromosomes that we'll end with, because in mitosis you end with the same number of chromosomes you started with, whereas in meiosis you're going to get that down to half. In order to do that, we'll have to go through two divisions, and we're going to divide those divisions up into what's called meiosis one and meiosis II. Meiosis is sometimes called reduction division because we need to get our uh, 46 chromosomes down to 23. So here's a little uh, math for us here. So a diploid cell we say is 2n. n is one set of chromosomes, so for a human, n is 23. And so a haploid cell would just be 1n, and a diploid cell is 2n, or 46 chromosomes, going from 2 to half, right? And this meiosis reduction division is going to be what creates gametes, or sperm and egg, in the testes and the ovaries. Just like in mitosis, we're going to go through a regular cell stage called interphase first, before we go through meiosis. And there should be some familiar uh, letters here. G1, that's when the cell grows. S is the synthesis phase when DNA is duplicated. And G2 is when that cell finishes growing and making cytoplasm and organelles to get ready for cell division coming up. So those things will also happen prior to meiosis, just like it did in mitosis. The little reminder that DNA is indeed duplicated in the S phase before meiosis. So that means in order for us to get down to one set of chromosomes, we will have to go through two divisions because this happens. So why does this happen? It seems kind of like a waste of time. Well, like we said, meiosis evolved from mitosis. 
So it's using a lot of the same process, a lot of the same machinery. So that's just the way it goes. And uh, we're just going to have to do two divisions, I guess. And I just stopped the uh, video here to fix my slide. Uh, there's a mistake in both of these lines here. During the S phase, each chromosome is duplicated. It becomes composed of two identical copies. And we call those identical copies sister chromosomes or sister chromatids. And they're held together in kind of that middle region called the centromere. In an animal cell, the centromeres or centrosomes that organize the microtubules of the mitotic spindle also will replicate. So we'll have two of those. So we're going to divide this all up into two divisions, meiosis one and meiosis two. So let's talk meiosis one first. And the phases that we named back in mitosis, we're going to use a lot of those same names here in meiosis, but we're going to put a one or a two after them, depending on if they're associated with meiosis one or meiosis two. So these first four will be uh, associated with meiosis one. So prophase one, we'll start there. There's some similar things that might happen during this time. But this first part is different uh, with how the chromosomes act. It's kind of interesting. So our nuclear envelope, our nucleus, is going to break down just like it did in mitosis. Uh, but in this case, which is really interesting in how this even happens, but the proteins that are associated with the homologous chromosomes will bring the pair close to each other. So basically, Chromosome pairs, number one, will find each other and come together during prophase one. Chromosome pair number two comes together. Three comes together. It's amazing how they can just find each other and come together. This is called synapsis, like they're out looking for their partner. Remember that within you, you have one of each of those. So pair number one, you got one from mom, one from dad. Pair number two, you got one from mom, one from dad. Those pairs find each other or go through synapsis during meiosis one or prophase one. So in synapsis, the genes on the chromatids of the homologous pair are precisely aligned with one another. So they line up so that their genes are across from each other. Then an exchange of chromosome segments, segments of whole genes, more, more than one gene at a time, will cross or exchange places amongst those pairs of chromosomes. It kind of makes me scared for a minute that, whoa, this chromosome is switching chunks of itself with another chromosome, but uh, it's the same amount, so you're not losing anything when this is happening. This is called crossing over, and you can guess this really like mixes up the genes that are on those chromosomes. It's going to be one of our sources of variation in sexual reproduction and creating gametes. The ex exchange spot, spot is called the chiasmata, where these chromosomes, these homologous pairs, joined each other and switched pieces. And because everything kind of looks, they're, they're so close together, it looks kind of like an X shape. They're called tetrads at this point. So crossing over then creates diversity. So when that sister chromatid is moved into a gamete, it'll carry some DNA from one parent and some from the other. So it mixes up your mom and dad's genes that you got from them. This is now like a, called a recombinant because you recombined your mom and dad's DNA on your chromosomes. So it's a recombinant sister chromatid now and has a new combination of maternal and paternal genes that never existed before. The nucleus will continue to break down. Those centrioles that help set up the mitotic spindle will move apart or migrate to opposite poles of the cell. And those are going to be, the mitotic spindle is what is going to help pull chromosomes apart. And the mitotic spindle will continue to pull chromosomes towards 
the equator or middle of the cell. So here's a diagram of what this is looking like. So interesting process. So here we've got our homologous pair. We'll say the blue one is, uh, let's say that's your dad's chromosome number one, and the red one is your cro uh, mom's chromosome number one with the little letters here signifying genes that are in those spots or loci of those chromosomes. So they do synapsis by coming together and they line up. Look how nice they're lined up. These gene segments are right across from one another. And on the sister chromatids in the middle here that are touching, these are going to be the chiasmata right here where the pieces are going to swap chromosomes. So when we're all done, take a look at our result. The gene that was on dad's chromosome, big C, is now on mom's and vice versa. The, big, the little C from mom is now on dad's. So really here, even though these are sister chromatids on the blue, they're not identical anymore. So the one on the right is different than the one on the left now. And same thing with mom's chromosomes. Those again were starting off as sister chromatids that were duplicated and the same, same genes. Now there's a different combination on there. We have literally mixed up the genes from mom and dad's chromosomes. How awesome is that? We are creating something that has never existed before. Then let's move to metaphase one. In some cases, it kind of looks like metaphase and mitosis with a big difference though. So we have our homologous pairs. They had found each other and had gone through synapsis and were pulled towards the middle. They actually stay together. Our chromosomes are not lined up all 46 of them single file. They're actually with their partner during metaphase one of meiosis one. So which side they go on, whether their uh, mom's chromosome is on the left and dad's is on the right, or vice versa, is independent of all the other chromosomes. They don't look at each other and say, hey, all mom's chromosomes, let's get on the right. All of dad's chromosomes, let's get on the left. So we end up in the same daughter cells. That does not happen. The chromosomes don't look at each other and make a big plan. They just randomly line up, whether they're on the right or the left. So you're going to get a mix of mom and dad's chromosomes going on the right and the left. And this is called independent assortment because it's random and because it mixes up mom and dad's chromosomes. Uh, it's another source of genetic variation. And we can do the math here that humans have 23 chromosome pairs. So imagine 23 chromosome pairs lined up in the middle of a cell. And they can swap places back and forth, whether they're on the right or the left. And so they're, they could be on the right or the left. That's what the 2 means. 2 to the 23rd. And if you did the math, it's a big number. It creates over 8 million possibilities with genetic variation. What could go into a gamete, a sperm or an egg, to go on to create an individual. And this, 8 million, doesn't even include crossing over with all the genetic variations that can occur from that. So given these two mechanisms of independent assortment and crossing over, it's highly unlikely that any two haploid cells or gametes, sperm or egg, resulting from meiosis would have the same genetic comp composition. So once again, here's some pictures to show uh, independent assortment. They're kind of small, once again, on the slides. But if you go to the OpenStax Concepts of Biology book, then they are a little bit bigger to look at. And you can view that online or in the physical copy of the book itself. So here's what I'm talking about with independent assortment. If there was an organism who only had two pairs of chromosomes, Imagine if both of dads were on left and both of moms on right, then dads would end up in the daughter cells over here. But we can mix that up if uh, we flip 
on the bottom ones and put moms over on the left, dads on the right, then we get a mix of mom and dad's uh, chromosomes in that would end up in our gametes. Then we go on to anaphase 1, which again this looks a lot like mitosis, where we're going to pull chromosomes apart, but at in this case, since the partners are in the middle, we're not going to pull the sister chromatids apart, we're going to pull the partners apart, the homologous pairs. So if I go back to this picture, we're going to pull mom and dad's homologous pairs apart from one another like you see here. So these big middle cells, that's a result of anaphase 1. It's the chiasma connections that are broken in anaphase 1. As the fibers attach to the fused kinetic cores, those are little proteins hanging off the centromeres that pull the chromosomes apart, the homologous chromosomes apart. The kinetic cores are the proteins that the mitotic spindle grabs onto. So here's what that would look like in a model. After crossing over, we've got the mixed up mom and dad's chromosomes. We're pulling them apart. There's the kinetic cores attached to the mitotic spindle. So in this case, we're pulling the homologous partners apart. We're just looking at the anaphase 1 up here because we haven't got to number 2 yet. But pulling the partners apart. So then we reach telophase and cytokinesis. Telophase 1 is where we're going to finish up the division of the nucleus, and cytokinesis is when the cytoplasm divides. How it happens, it depends on the species. In an animal cell, you can think of it like a belt being cinched around the middle until it tightens all the way, and the cytoplasm meets and seals off. And in a plant cell, vesicles from the Golgi will come and form a plate in the middle. So that looks a little bit different depending on what species we're looking at. So what would this look like if we're looking at an animal cell after this is done? We would see 23 chromosomes, but the 23 chromosomes would exist as these X's, as sister chromatids, even though now they have pieces of mom and dad's mixed up a little bit. So there are 23 chromosomes, but each chromosome has an extra chromatid on it. So we're going to have to go through another division to break that up. So that's why we have to go through meiosis 2. So the cells might enter a brief kind of a break called an interphase or an interkinesis. This would lack that S phase, so no duplication of DNA this time. The two cells produced in meiosis 1 would go through all of those events of meiosis 2 in synchrony. So our two daughter cells that we've created are going to both go through this. So we have two daughter cells. We are going to end up with four when this is all said and done. And basically, meiosis 2 is going to look a lot like mitosis, very similar. So we'll go through a prophase 2 where chromosomes, if they decondense during telophase, some organisms they do, some they don't, they would become visible again by condensing and wrapping really tight around those proteins that make chromosomes really visible. And our nuclear envelope would go away once again, fragment into vesicles. The centrosomes with their centrioles, which is what helps the uh, mitosis spindle set up, would start moving away from one another towards opposite poles. New mitotic spindle, or meiotic spindle, I should say, is formed. Like in metaphase 2, our chromosomes would be pulled to the middle or center of the cell. But if you can picture this time, there's 23 single file chromosomes, but they all consist of the X pattern, the sister chromatids. Then in anaphase 2, those sister chromatids would be pulled apart. So let me get this picture up for you. 
So up here in anaphase one, we had the partner, homologous partners pulled apart. But in anaphase two, now we're going to pull our sister chromatids apart. So that looks like this right here in the bottom picture. So you're going to see them being pulled to opposite poles till we get to telophase two. Those chromosomes arrive at opposite poles. They'll begin to unwind around those proteins or decondense. Nuclear envelope, the nucleus comes back from little vesicles of phospholipids that create the nuclear envelope. And cytokinesis will separate those two daughter cells into four genetically unique haploid cells. So at this point, the nuclei in the newly produced cells are both haploid and will have only one copy of the single set of chromosomes. So just in a human, 23 chromosomes that exist as just one chromatid. But now it's a mix of your mom and dad's uh, chromatids, uh, chromosomes. And some of the chromosomes, you know, will have a piece of mom's here, a piece of dad's there from crossing over, mixes it all up, creates diversity. So if we did a little comparison, a little Venn diagram, here we would say what's similar, that meiosis and mitosis is both a type of nuclear division in eukaryotes. They use similar machinery. They both have that S phase prior to division, which is going to duplicate the DNA. In mitosis, though, that was a single division that resulted in a basically a clone of the original cell. It started with a diploid cell and it ended with a diploid cell. And those two identical daughter cells are identical. They have the same DNA. In meiosis, we go through two divisions, which is a reduction division. It uh, creates variation in the daughter cells. And it starts with a diploid germ cell in, in uh, testes or ovaries and ends as a haploid cell. And actually you get four products, four daughter cells, instead of just two. And these pictures compare those two processes. You'll be able to see uh, bigger pictures if you take a look at the pictures from the book. But pay particular attention to each step and watch what those chromosomes are doing during each step. Unfortunately, these processes are not perfect, and we can get errors, just like it can happen in mitosis as well. By the end of section 7.3, you should be able to explain how non-disjunction leads to disorders in chromosome number, and describe how errors in chromosome structure can occur through different errors of inversions and translocations. So let's talk making mistakes, errors. So inherited disorders can arise when chromosomes behave abnormally during meiosis. It's processes that scientists are trying to understand why this happens. Why do chromosomes behave this way? It happens once in a while and sometimes can then be inherited in your offspring. So chromosome disorders can be divided into two categories abnormalities in the number of them, how many there are, or in their structural rearrangement. And because even small segments of chromosomes can span many genes, chromosome disorders are characteristically dramatic and often fatal, meaning that the fetus wouldn't even develop if it came from a fertilized egg or sperm that had one of these errors, but sometimes they do survive. So we'll take a look at that. So let's look at disorders in chromosome number first. And these can be detected even before the baby is born by using a karyotype. A karyotype is the number and appearance of your chromosomes, including how long they are, their banding pattern, and their centromere position. And scientists know what these should be and can compare them to other ones to know whether there's the right amount of chromosomes there or not. To obtain a view, though, of your 
uh, karyotype, a cytologist, that's one who studies cells, would photograph your chromosomes when they're in meiosis and then cut and paste them into a, a chart called a karyogram, shown on the next slide here. So obviously chromosome pair number one, those are the longest. Remember these would be homologous, one from mom, one from dad. Pair two, and as we keep going down the line, they get smaller and smaller till we get to a chromosome pair number 21 is actually the smallest and has the least amount of genes, but there was a mistake made back in the day and they just never fixed it and they left 21 and 22 where they were. And then we get to, these are all called autosomes, regular chromosomes, and then we get to the sex chromosomes. And in this case, there's two X's there, which would be homologous with each other. If this was a male, there would be another tiny chromosome next to it, which would be the Y chromosome, which has maybe only 30 genes or so on it. The X and the Y are not homologous and have very different genes. But by looking at this, I could see that this fetus or this individual has the right amount of chromosomes. And the pieces all look pretty normal just looking at this. So I would say this is a normal human female here with cells during, uh, or chromosomes during mitosis. So disorders like that, that result from what's called a non, or that would, uh, result with more chromosomes or less chromosomes than what you should have would be easily identifiable on that chart or karyogram or karyotype. A duplication or loss of entire chromosomes, you'd be able to see that, that something is missing or that there's an extra there. There could also be uh, more than one set, theoretically, but normally in a human that probably would not survive. So these disorders are called non-disjunction or caused by non-disjunction. It basically means that during anaphase one or two, the chromosomes failed to be pulled apart from one another. So you could have that happen during anaphase one or anaphase two. If it's anaphase one, that meant that the homologous pair did not get pulled apart. They went together to the same daughter cell. If it happens during anaphase two, then the sister chromatids did not get pulled apart. They went to the same daughter cell. As a parent gets older, the risk of non-disjunction goes up. They used to associate it mostly with the mother, but they have found that it can happen with the father as well. So here's a diagram to show what that would look like if it occurred during anaphase one or meiosis one. And both of these of this pair ended up in the same daughter cell. Or if in anaphase two or meiosis two, that uh, both chromatids ended up staying together and not being pulled apart. And how that would affect the offspring cells. And then any of these then if fertilized, could be transmitted onto your offspring. Aneuploidy, this slide. So a euploid is an individual with the appropriate number of chromosomes for their species. So in humans, that would be 22 pairs of autosomes and the one pair of sex chromosomes. Aneuploid or aneuploidy is when there's an error in chromosome number. This could include monosomy. That means there's only one chromosome of a pair. Like, uh, for instance, the X chromosome. There could be a female who only has one X chromosome and then not an X or a Y. That's an example where you could actually survive that monosomy. Or a trisomy. Tri means three. So you actually have an extra of a chromosome. Now a lot of these you would die as a fetus or never uh, be able to develop properly because you don't have the right amount of essential genes or you have too many, not enough. 
but with some of the smaller chromosomes, they've seen individuals be born with those disorders, especially in chromosomes 13, 15, 18, 21, and 22, which results in offspring that could live for several weeks to many years, but often there is problems, and some of them big problems. Like uh, if you do a Google search of trisomy 13, 15, and 18, you'll see some devastating effects for having a trisomy of those. Trisomy 21, you may have heard of, it's called Down syndrome. That's one we can actually survive with, probably because 21 is that smallest chromosome and affects the least amount of genes. But we do know there are some problems with that. There's a characteristic uh, physical feature that goes with that in the face. Uh, you can usually see someone with trisomy 21 and know that they actually have Down syndrome. There's developmental delays in growth and cognition and sometimes other physical problems as well. And of course, like we've said before, the incidence of Down syndrome goes up with especially maternal age, but can go up with paternal age as well. So there's a chart showing that, that once a female uh, hits her 40s, it zooms way up very quickly. Probably with the aging and the creating of the gametes, the mitotic spindle probably just doesn't work as good as when you're young and fails to pull apart chromosomes like it should. X inactivation, you probably noticed if I go back here, that if you are a female, you have more chromosome, basically more chromosome uh, stuff than a male would because a male would have a Y, which would be really teeny tiny. So basically females have more stuff here than males. So to make up for that, there's this process called X inactivation. It happens early in development in a female mammal, if I can talk here. In the embryo, it consists of just a few thousand cells at a time, and in all of those cells, one X is randomly inactivated, and it then is called a bar body, and any of the genes that are on that bar body then are not expressed. So only the genes on the other X that did not get inactivated are expressed. And as that cell then goes through mitosis for the rest of development of the fetus, then all of the genes expressed will come from the activated X chromosome, but not the bar body. So basically this helps enable females to compensate for their double genetic dose of whatever is on their X chromosome. So this actually leads to a, a very visual thing, if you've ever heard of tortoiseshell cats. I am a huge fan of cats. In fact, I actually have a tortoiseshell cat. Her name is Bella here. Uh, the cat on the right, or excuse me, the cat on the left is the textbook cat, and I thought, well, that cat looks kind of ornery, doesn't it? It's beautiful, but kind of looking ornery. So I put a picture over here on the right of my cat, Bella, who is just a gorgeous tortoiseshell cat. So basically what's going on here that makes X inactivation visual for us is that the gene for color for cats is on the X chromosome. And it can come in two forms, black and orange. So if a cat is what you call heterozygous and they carry a copy of the black gene on one X chromosome and the orange gene on the other chromosome, Remember, one of those gets deactivated, so cells will only express one of them. So in some cells, the black gene is being expressed, and in some, it's the yellow. So it makes it very visual that you can see with the patches on tortoiseshell cats exactly where the cells are exhibiting the orange or are expressing the black. Very neat stuff. Now an odd thing about non-disjunction and uh, aneuploidy is that 
autosomes are very sensitive to having not enough or too many chromosomes or having too much or not enough gene product, which is proteins. But the X and the Y chromosomes are not. So basically you could be born with extra or less of these and still survive. So here's some examples. A monosomy of the X chromosome where a female only has one X chromosome and no other uh, partner there, no X, no Y, just the one X. That's called Turner syndrome. And a female can survive with this, though if you Google it, you'll see that there are some physical features that go along with it, um, and usually a sterility. They're infertile. Then there's XXY, Kleinfelter syndrome. So this would be a male who's carrying around an extra X chromosome, uh, usually though sterile. There's also Jacob syndrome, a male who's carrying an extra Y chromosome, and a female, uh, metafemale XXX, and this is a female carrying an extra X chromosome, which these are all very survivable. In fact, going back to the uh, tortoise shell example, whenever you see a tortoise shell cat, you know they're a female, but the exception would be the Kleinfelter syndrome that I just mentioned, that uh, it could, uh, very, very slim chance, but could possibly be a cat who has Kleinfelters be a male who has the uh, XXY combination, but that would be very rare. But do a little internet search and they they have found some cats that are tortoiseshell and are XXY with Kleinfelters. But again, once, uh, once again, these are all survivable because the sex chromosomes are less sensitive to having extra gene product. Very amazing stuff. Polyploidy is when you have an extra whole set of chromosomes, not just one extra number 13 or an extra 21. It's the whole set is extra. And there are some animals that have this. They might tend to be sterile, although uh, they've seen this in flatworms, but flatworms can also reproduce asexually, so it really doesn't matter that sexually they might be sterile. But um, this would normally probably destroy a lot of animals or humans if this would happen. But it is common in the plant kingdom, and polyploid plants tend to be larger and more robust than the euploids, the normal ones of their species. Now there's some other structural rearrangements that can happen, including duplications, deletions, inversions, and translocations. So duplications and deletions often produce offspring that survive, but will exhibit physical and mental abnormalities, such as in a disease called cri de chez, which is French for cry of the cat. It's a syndrome associated with the nervous system abnormalities and identifiable physical features that you can tell they have cri de chez just by looking at them. It happens um, from a deletion in most of the small arm of chromosome number five. And infants with this syndrome will emit a very characteristic high-pitched cry that sounds like a cat just crying out, hence its name. An inversion, that's where you uh, turn something upside down. Chromosome inversions and translocations can be identified by observing cells through meiosis because the homologous chromosomes with their rearrangement in one of the pair have to contort to maintain their proper gene alignment during that prophase one. So you can actually see this happening if you're watching a cell in meiosis. In a chromosome inversion, there's a detachment and then a 180 degree rotation and a reinsertion of part of the chromosome. And unless it disrupts a gene sequence, inversions might only change the orientation of the gene that and they're likely maybe to have a less of an effect, a more of a mild effect. A translocation occurs when a segment 
of one chromosome dissociates and then reattaches onto another one, another non-homologous chromosome, like a piece of five attaching onto number nine. They can be benign or they can have very bad devastating effects depending on the position of the gene and uh, the regulatory sequences and such. They have been associated with some cancers and schizophrenia and reciprocal translocations result from the exchange of chromosome segments between two non-homologous chromosomes such as that there's no gain or loss of genetic information. So here's a picture of a young man who has Cretaché at uh, age 2, 4, 9, and 12 and has some physical features that you can actually see belong to the uh, Cretaché. Here's a picture of an inversion. Look what happens. It gets inverted there. And a reciprocal translocation right here where you still have the genes intact but now they're somewhere else. On another note, coming from your OpenStax Concepts of Biology textbook, the uh, chromosome 18 inversion. Not all structural rearrangements of chromosomes produce non-viable, impaired, or infertile individual, individuals. In rare instances, a change can result in the evolution of a new species. In fact, an inversion in chromosome 18 appears to have contributed to the evolution of humans. That inversion is not present in our closest genetic relative, the chimpanzees. So you can read through that to see how that's related. Then we've got the end of the chapter questions that once again I always recommend that you go through. And critical thinking questions as well. All right. Hope you enjoyed learning about meiosis and let me know if you have any questions.